Good evening and welcome to Holy Trinity Seminary's Lecture Series 2013-2014. It's my pleasure today to introduce to you Archpriest John Strickland, who's come to us today all the way from California. He was born and educated in California. After discovering a love of Russian history uh, and culture as an undergraduate in California, California State University, Fullerton, he went on to do research in St. Petersburg for two years. He obtained his master's in modern European history from the State University of New York, Stony Brook, and was awarded a PhD in Russian and European history from the University of California at Davis in 2001. Uh, currently, he is Associate Professor of History at St. Catherine College in Encinitas, California, and the rector or attached to the parish of St. John of Damascus in Church uh, in Poway, California. Uh, Father John and his wife, uh, Yelena, who he met in St. Petersburg, uh, live in Southern California with their five children. Today, uh, interviewing Father John will be our own director of publications here at Holy Trinity uh, Publications, uh, Mr. Nicholas Chapman. Thank Welcome, you. Father John. Thank you. We're here to talk today about a, a book that we've just published, which is hopefully many of you have seen, called The Making of Holy Russia. The Orthodox Church and Russian Nationalism Before the Revolution. And this is the work of Father John Strickland, who's sitting next to me. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk for a while, following basically two sections about the book <coughs> in an interview format, and then open up to any questions you might have following the discussions, either from something we, we discuss or anything else. I know at least one person here who told me he had got to page 200 of the book. I don't know if we have any advances on page 200 or not. So, when looking at a book, I suppose the first, the, the title of a book is all, is all important. And I look at this book and I see The Making of Holy Russia. Now, that immediately raises a question in my mind is, obviously, what is Holy Russia? And why is it being made? Doesn't it, isn't Holy Russia something that existed? Um, so, what are we talking about? What period of history are we talking about to start with? Mm -hmm. And then... And then how is Holy Russia being made? In what sense, does what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Father Luke, and, and everyone here. Um, well, Holy Russia, as that word, uh, Rus Svetaira, Svetaira Rus, um, exists, existed uh, for hundreds of years. Orthodox Christianity shaped uh, Russian nationality, Russian life, Russian bleep, Russian experience for hundreds of years. Uh, beginning with the baptism of 988 under Vladimir. And uh, for those hundreds of years, uh, Russia became a land uh, that was infused with Orthodox Christianity, where all aspects of life were permeated with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the experience of the Orthodox Church. Um, so that's, in a certain sense, what Holy Russia is. Uh, however, uh, in modern times, roughly beginning with the time of Peter the Great, uh, but maybe not quite exactly at that time, uh, a lot of that um, spiritual life uh, was lost to Russians, especially beginning in the upper classes, the aristocracy, the state itself. Um, and by the 19th century, a lot of the common people mm -hmm. were obviously no longer, from the clergy's point of view, um, as affected by, as as uh, as um, as uh, engaged with the mm -hmm. Orthodox tradition as as they appeared to have been in the past. Mm -hmm. So the title of the book, "The Making of Holy Russia," takes as a as a kind of given that there was a time when Russia had uh, and bore this uh, spirit of Orthodox Christian culture. Um, but there's an effort to, as it were, remake that uh, to advance that to a uh, generation that had lost it mm -hmm. to a large degree. And w one thing you identify in the book, I mean, the, the Russian Revolution, I, I would certainly hope everybody here is familiar with as an idea and, and would be able to name the date if we were to ask them. Uh, but you also mentioned the great reforms as being a kind of a marker that perhaps uh, leads to big changes in Russian society that then in turn leads to this need to have a conscious, if you like, project Mm -hmm. of, of making holy Russia. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah. what, what are the great reforms about and, and how does that play into this? Sure, yeah. So 
So professional historians uh, often think of um, the history of Russia uh, under the empire, which begins formally with Peter the Great. It really started under Ivan the Terrible. Uh, but formally, let's call it about the year 1700, all the way up until 1917 when the revolution occurs, as uh, having, well, three phases. One's the early empire, that would be Peter and Catherine, 18th century. Um, the middle period, which is a period where there's, uh, after the um, French Revolution, especially the invasion of Napoleon in 1812, a kind of pulling back from the project to westernize Russia radically under Peter and Catherine, that's how it was. Um, a kind of bit, uh, calling into question how much of Western civilization is healthy for Russia, um, calling that into question. Um, and that finds its kind of last expression in the, uh, in the great reforms of Alexander II. Uh, he reigned from 1855 uh, to 1881, assassinated uh, at the end of his life. And his, his effort had been to undertake a substantial reforms of Russian society and, and, uh, and government. And most accounts, most appraisals of those reforms are that they failed fundamentally to shape or reshape Russian life uh, to make Russia a more powerful and stable society. So that by the year 1881, there's a real doubt that that is the proper approach. So I deal with the final period or phase of the empire, empire and that would be 1881 to 1917. Mm -hmm. And it takes place kind of in re, some ways reaction to the great reforms. Great reforms that liberated the peasants, liberated the serfs, the peasants from serfdom. They, there was a lot of judicial reforms and all sorts of other, you know, if you study Russian history, you know some of those reforms are very important. Novelists of the 19th century sometimes, you know, uh, talk about the effects of those reforms. Um, but uh, they were seen uh, largely as having failed to go to the very heart of what it meant to be Russian. They were still very shaped by a kind of Western model of, um, you might call it rationalism, a bureaucratic approach to um, to social problems and, and, and political needs. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the clergy um, following that period um, were, were strengthened in their conviction that the faith is what's needed most of all, the mm -hmm. Orthodox faith, uh, in its most conventional and traditional uh, sense. Mm -hmm. So so how, who are some of the, well, first, I think first of all, who are some of the people, who, is, who, who are the names that we would be reading about in here who are, advocating for a different approach, which you've typified as the making of Holy Russia. And and then what what are the elements of that approach and what, what needs are those things addressing? Mm -hmm. What are they responding to exactly? Mm -hmm. So the 19th century saw a real expansion of the Orthodox Church's infrastructure in Russia, uh, spiritual academies, uh, seminaries, journal publications, just just explode because of the resources the Holy Synod of the Church um, could could uh, could assemble, and out of this very very strong, in a certain sense, administratively strong Church, um, came these voices of renewal. Let's call them. Um, one good example is Antoni Krapovitsky that I talk about in the book. He shows up repeatedly in the book as an advocate for the renewal um, of the Church but in a sense of, um, of making it more in line with the traditions, the authentic traditions, patristic traditions, canonical traditions, scriptural traditions um, of, of, of orthodoxy. And there were all sorts of hierarchs that, um, that, that wanted to see this happen. Um, one hierarch named Nicanor, um, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, he, he was behind the effort to organize a all-Russian, call it a national, commemoration of the baptism of Russia in 1888, which mm -hmm. is the first big event I talk about. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, um, sets a precedent for not only the celebration in 1988, as the Soviet Union is collapsing, um, but recent celebration of the uh, 1,025th anniversary of that mm -hmm. event. And I mean, this, this baptismal celebration in Kiev is, is featured very early in the book. What exactly, I mean, is this, are we talking about a liturgy being held in Kiev, or what else is going on around this? What's what's the substance of the celebration, and how how big a celebration is it? Where are people coming from? Yeah, These kind of things. Well, you know, the the church leadership of the time was 
doing two things. One was they were um, they were uh, they were finding ways of engaging their society, the society of their time, which was a society more and more influenced by nationalism. So someone who studies modern European history knows that this is sometimes called the age of nationalism, and it has a tragic culmination in the First World War, and it's still with us today, and, and sometimes it has uh, very destructive um, effects on Western civilization. And they were, but they were looking at that, that movement and seeing its power to shape modern society. It was really, in the West, a largely secular phenomenon, nationalism. But they understood that this could be harnessed to serve the interests of the church, to strengthen the Orthodox Church in Russia. And so in addition to having this openness to engaging something that was relatively new in, in history, nationalism, um, they also were bringing uh, to bear the tradition of the church, which goes back uh, for centuries all the way back to the first century. They were committed to a kind of... Uh, traditional understanding of what the faith was, and they were using nationalism to bring people into contact with that faith, which is why they chose and preferred the word patriotism over nationalism. Um, Antoni Krapovitsky actually used, used the term uh, pravoslavny patriotism, and he, he expressly criticized what he called secular nationalism, uh, sometimes uh, zoological nationalism is a term used by the Orthodox clergy uh, as a kind of um, ethnic, um, divisive, uh, even potentially violent form of nationalism, which they said the Orthodox Church absolutely uh, does not accept. And they were really trying to, they were really trying to evangelize, I think, their, their culture and the, that force in their time. They were trying to find what's good in national identity and bringing that into contact with the rich tradition of Orthodox Christianity in Russia, especially from the Middle Ages. Uh, they use the term Rus, you know, which is the, the term most often used to describe the community of Russians before the time of Peter the Great, uh, over the term Russia, which of course is a term, <coughs> pardon me, used to describe Russia more or less of, of the imperial period. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what are the, can you give examples of if you like, elements of, of of a nationalism that can become a good orthodox patriotism as opposed to, and perhaps also what, what would be aspects of nationalism that actually run counter to the gospel and to the orthodox tradition. Can you mm -hmm. dis distinguish yeah. those a bit? Yeah, right. So, so they were always making reference to the scriptures, to the canons of the church, to the examples of the fathers um, uh, of the church, to saints' lives. Again, their project was, uh, you know, completely immersed within the life experience, historical life experience of the Orthodox Church. For them, a healthy form of uh, patriotism, a truly Orthodox patriotism, uh, would be one in which something like the uh, baptism of Russia, of Rus, in 988 uh, in Kiev, uh, was a primordial event, a kind of original event. Okay, so as Americans, maybe we can think of what our national history is here in America. Things like the Boston Tea Party, right? You know, to say nothing of the whole Revolutionary War. But there are these events that we kind of like are brought, our minds are brought to, to think of that as a very defining moment. Well, the Boston Tea Party, okay, which preceded the American Revolution, was an event that brought attention to taxation on Americans, right? You know, and that we stand for, you know, kind of this... No, we won't be no taxation without representation. That kind of that kind of doctrine, uh, which shapes a lot of modern American identity. You know, not only libertarianism, but just this kind of liberal spirit in America, you know, private property, individualism, and so forth. Well, okay, so go back to Russia, 1988, uh, and they are asking Russians to think about their nationality by going back in time. Not, for instance, the creation of the great empire of Peter the Great and his successors, which truly was a great empire, defeated Napoleon in 1812. Uh, not think about political power, not think about economic strength, not think about things like that, or even the people who are so famous in our time, even today, Tolstoy, Tchaikovsky, and the great cultural figures. They're asking Russians to go back in time to when they received Christianity in the Orthodox form 
from the Byzantine Empire, from the Greeks. And they were asking Russians to be, to, to be Russian, to think about their nationality um, as an experience that continues that tradition, mm -hmm. something rooted in the Orthodox faith. But, but given that there were many people within the Russian Empire who were not of a Russian ethnicity, many uh, Siberian tribes, for example, <clears throat> um, stretching into, of course, Alaska until 1867, uh, given that there were other faiths present, there were various forms of Protestant sectarians, there were obviously Muslims and Buddhists and so on. How, one thing I'm not sure about is how, how can there be a, a national identity focused, if you like, on the heritage of the church, when clearly there are many people who are not in the church and presumably don't want to be in the church. How did the, how did they, how, and, and so if we're talking about Holy Russia as a missionary vehicle, how did that m sense of, of, of Rus work in terms of evangelizing, you know, from Kazan or something like this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Sense? Yeah, it does, and and that's that's where the, the the gospel and its principle of a universal faith um, came in because they were very committed to that, and it's clear when they were addressing uh, national uh, organizations and, and nationalists, even mm -hmm. they would often um, emphasize that uh, Orthodox Christianity is a universal faith. They would quote Saint Paul, who said, "You know, there's no longer Greek or Jew." Um, they would make that very clear. And in fact, in a certain way, they were evan they were trying to evangelize and win over those secular nationalists. I think that project, uh, in many ways, failed. Um, but it was definitely an honorable and uh, pro uh, honorable project worth undertaking. Um, how did they try to make Russia into a nation? Well, this has been tried in other countries too in modern times. Um, again, the idea is to create a sense of community to enable that community to. Uh, to enter into the modern world and modern experiences with a with a great deal of unity and strength and common identity. Mm -hmm. For them, Orthodox Christianity was was the ultimate source of that identity. Um, nationhood, nationality could be used as a means to to uh, to achieve that end. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the mission effort. Well, mm -hmm. so there's all sorts of missionary activity. This is a time of booming missionary activity in the Never, like never before in the history of the Orthodox Church. So they, they were very conscious that they were reaching out beyond just Russians themselves. However, however, um, you know, what I found in the research is, you know, there was, there was more attention to what they considered to be kind of natively Russian people than you mentioned some of the other, the Kalmyks or whoever mm -hmm. else is out there, the, the non-Orthodox, mm -hmm. the non-Russian the non community. The, um, the mission in Russia at this time specifically had two kind of wings, two kind of um, elements. One was the external mission, which would be to non-Orthodox, okay? This would be like Nicholas of Japan's work, for instance. And then there was the inner mission, and this was to the Orthodox Christians in Russia itself who needed to be evangelized because they were insufficiently catechized, they were insufficiently um, informed about their church life, maybe they lived as peasants out in Siberia and didn't have a, a local church that they could get to easily, and so um, there were a lot of needs for just the very the Orthodox population mm -hmm. itself. That's the population that really received primary attention by mm -hmm. these. And so in, in attempting to draw people more into the life of the church, the, if you like, the making of Holy Russia project, what kind of elements, what was the, uh, what was the weaponry, if you like, in the that the clergy had at their disposal. Yeah. I mean, how, if we take our, our farmer in Voronezh or our industrial worker in St. Petersburg, how, how were they being reached, as it were? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so they, they, they talked about these missionaries, and this is like missionary congresses are being held. Um, there's missionary societies. Um, the czars themselves were supporting these. It was very, very public, very well known, um, and very well funded. An ambitious project. They they spoke about specifically a um, a cultural mission, a cultural mission. That is to say, a mission that would use culture, that would focus on cultural life, identity, mm -hmm. uh, in the broadest sense. And we're not talking about high culture, the arts, so much as we're just talking about you know bleep, the way of life that people live by. And so what they did was that they would try to identify 
the existing, the real and existing areas of historical Russian life that were most obviously shaped by Orthodox Christianity. Nas for example? For example, national saints. You know, Vladimir, great, great example. Sergius of Radonezh, another one. In 19, uh, 1912, um, there was a, a commemorated and a largely led by these very uh, uh, orthodox patriotic clergy, um, the commemoration of, uh, of Hermogen or, or, or Germagen, uh, the, uh, the important patriarch who helped Russia defend herself against the invasion of the Poles mm -hmm. and, and the infusion of a kind of uh, imposition of Roman Catholicism on Orthodox Russia in the time of the Troubles. And in 1913, um, he was canonized as a saint. And that took place in a context that was very much shaped by this mm. Orthodox patriotism. Mm -hmm. So they were holding the national saints of Russia up as examples. Uh, they were um, also bringing people's attentions to places of pilgrimage. Uh, I, was, I, I called these pilgrimages to the past because they were often hi place, uh, historical sites that brought Russians to, to think about their national history as being shaped by not St. Petersburg so much, which is the window on the west, mm. as much as Moscow or other famous places like Holy Trinity uh, Monastery, St. Sergius Lavra, north of Moscow. In fact, on that very point, I mentioned Petersburg. Um, it's well known that this was the most westernized city in the Russian Empire under Nicholas II, who really supported and identified with this whole project of Orthodox patriotism and tried himself in a very holy way to bring Russia back to uh, her, her kind of roots within the Orthodox faith at this critical time, and of course paid the price uh, of death uh, for it when, when the revolution finally came. Nicholas II um, supported and in many ways led an effort to transform the very cityscape, the very architectural um, cityscape of Pe Petersburg itself, by supporting the construction of temples, Orthodox Church temples, built in the medieval style from these earlier centuries. So those were largely blown up by the communists after the revolution. There's not much of a record left, though you can find books that, that compile the photographs of these. And I've seen these, very interesting. And it's an amazing, really, project because it, it, one can only imagine how much money went into building huge, huge churches in the medieval style all over and throughout Petersburg. The most famous example that survived communism, of course, is the Church of the um, Resurrection, uh, known as the Savior on the Blood in Petersburg. But the, the Church of, um, of the Savior on the Waters to commemorate the uh, sailors who died in the J Japanese War of 1904, mm -hmm. 1905 was one that got blown up. Mm -hmm. Many other churches. And, and so Petersburg itself, as a Window on the West was actually being transformed into an example, architecturally, of this earlier identity of an authentic, you know, an authentic Orthodox mm -hmm. um, nation. And this also was reflected in, in art as well? Yeah, so art also is an, uh, a great example. I, I talk in, the, um, in, in one chapter about the impact this whole movement had on artists and intellectuals who were not priests, in many ways were members of the intelligentsia, had this kind of, to some degree, came from an environment, not of necessarily free thinking, but of, of kind of independence from the real kind of life and leadership of the Orthodox Church and her clergy. So people like uh, Mikhail Nesterov, for instance, um, he, he painted a painting called Svitaya Rus, which is probably his most famous. Dates to 1905, right when that revolution um, that preceded the final revolution is occurring. Um, but he painted all sorts of paintings depicting monastic life, uh, depicting uh, often Russia, Russian scenes from earlier centuries. Uh, he contributed to the, uh, to the iconography, not only of Vladimir Cathedral in Kiev, which is, um, which is consecrated in the 1890s, but um, of the uh, convent established by the holy new martyr Elizabeth, the Grand Duchess. Uh, in, in in Moscow, so he was really at the center of attention. Yeah. And, and moving, I think now onto us, I feel like our second segment. If we can fast forward from the period that this book is dealing with, obviously, what the, what brings this period to an end is the Russian Revolution and and communism. Uh, but then, of course, thanks be to God, communism comes to an end seventy years later, roughly. Uh, 
to what extent <clears throat> is what was being said and promoted in that making of holy Russia before the revolution, to what extent has that been picked up since the fall of communism just over 20 years ago? It's been huge because the collapse, and what happened in the Soviet Union, as I interpret it, is you had a system of, uh, you, had, you had Christianity, you had or the Orthodox faith before the revolution. It was under attack. Obviously, it was under attack. I mean, the book is, the context of this is the crisis that the church faced with all of the attacks and challenges of modern life, of Western secular culture and philosophy and all this stuff, politics, nationalism being one of them. Um, and then you have communism, which tried to reproduce the comprehensive um, the comprehensive beliefs and values of the Orthodox Christian faith, uh, often directly, very often directly against that faith, hence the new martyrdom, hence the counterculture, like the cult of Lenin, the Lenin's tomb. I mean, obvious examples of just borrowing um, aspects of Orthodox Christian piety and trying to present them back to the Russian people in a communist ideological form. Mm -hmm. Well, that collapsed in the 1980s, right? It collapsed under glasnost. It was just gone. And the Orthodox Church, you know, played a, an important role in bringing that down. Uh, the commemoration of 1988 was an example of that, and there are others as well. When communism was, was when it collapsed, there was nothing to believe in in Russia, and that's still the problem today. It's why there's so much chaos in Russian culture today and political life and economic life and so forth. And so... Today, especially the Orthodox Church in Russia, I believe, is is offering Russians a sense of community, of national community. After all, um, the so Soviet Union, which pretty much reproduced the borders of the Russian Empire with all of its many different non-Russian peoples, is gone, and and you have the Russian Federation now, which of course includes many many non-Russians, but it's much more um, equipped to use nationality as a as a means of, uh, of unity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Russian Orthodox Church today is uh, in a very good position to remind people of the very heritage that the clergy 100 mm -hmm. years were trying to remind people of. Yes, and in fact, on the, on the back of the book, we quote from the, the Bishop's Council that was, was held in Moscow in, in February of this year, uh, Orthodoxy is being reborn as the foundation of national self-consciousness, uniting all the healthy forces in society those forces which strive for the transformation of life on the basis of a sure foundation and the spiritual and moral values that have entered the flesh and blood of our peoples. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, very much spoke to a, a, if you like, a renewal of the making of Holy Russia. But it seems to me there's also a problem, which is how, <clears throat> how both for the Russian church, how we identify with that heritage and a strengthened by the saints uh, and and everything that's good everything that's good there which is a phenomenal amount but at the same time uh, speaking personally I, I am not a russian there are other people here and you're not a russian uh how how does this project if you like carry over say into north america for example and how how, how might the basic ideas that were behind people like Metropolitan Anthony Karpovitsky, that, that they, they're thinking in terms of the need, if you like, to enculturate the faith, how do we carry that over? How do we have the, the keep the best of that and take forward this project, not in, not in Russia today, but in North America today? Yeah. Well, we live in a vastly different, uh, fundamentally different society, even than the troubled society of pre-revolutionary Russia. Um, and of course, the most dramatic difference is we do not have a history as Americans or Canadians. Uh, we do not have a history uh, where we can look back and find the influence of orthodoxy being the, the most important, the most profound influence for hundreds of years. So we, we simply don't have the same kind of a situation. However, however, the, the basic project of the making of Holy Russia, as I tried to define it before the revolution in Russia, was to bring the life of the church, to bring the life of the Orthodox Church into that society, to en to engage aspects of that society. You mentioned um, enculturation, I believe you used mm -hmm. that phrase, something like it. 
to um, use the culture to, to, to bring people into the life that's eternal, that goes beyond culture. And I think we in, in North America uh, do have that same calling, that same responsibility in the variety of ways that, that God has given us to, to, uh, uh, to, to use in but, our time. But can, can we also, even for those who are, who are not either not ethnically Russian or have no living experience of Russia, uh, can we can we learn from and borrow from the the heritage of of Orthodox Russia, or is that just really not relevant, or or if there is something relevant, what is relevant, and how how do we begin to participate in that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think again, what what we can be inspired by is the faith of so many of the of the church leaders a hundred years ago in Russia. Um, some of the people I talk about are new martyrs. They, they were put to death for their faith. Um, and uh, we can be inspired by their zeal to go to a, to, a, to a generation of their contemporaries and their fellow countrymen um, who have really turned their back on traditional Christianity and call them back uh, with love, um, to call them back by looking at aspects of our our common our common culture, and engage them. So in America, you mm -hmm. know, specifically in Canada or America, and North America generally, even Mexico, uh, uh, we can we can do that. We can find uh, things in our culture today that can be uh, brought into the life of the church. We can find points of connection. There's so many Christians, of course, that we still thank God have around us non-Orthodox Christians that are open to conversations about what it means to be a Christian. And we can, um, we can make use of the culture that America offers us. And we actually have in North America, if we compare it to like Europe today, we have, Christianity has so much more um, legitimacy in our popular culture in America than it does in Sweden, France, you know, whatever, choose your European uh, formerly Christian country of the West. Um, I think Canada probably less. I have a Canadian friend who would say less, but but uh, certainly in the United States, there's still a legitimacy to that, and we can reach out and we can we can engage those people and you know talk about our Orthodox faith and and maybe bring them to an, a better understanding of, of 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 Christianity by by being witnesses to that. But can we can we also be adopted in some sense into Holy Russia? Both, in I suppose the most obvious way. I mean, and people here often have the opportunity, and I think it's something very, uh, for my for my own life in the church. I, I I can't imagine where I would be today if I hadn't spent time in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So there's the po the possibility of. I mean, you mentioned you know Sergei Posad that we can, albeit but rather greater expense. Maybe we can we can still go to some of these places, and and you know the relics. Of saints can be brought here, icons can be are, are brought here, so there is there also that sense in which we can participate in in an ongoing sense of holy Russia. Yeah, absolutely, and a lot of that has been actually brought sometimes, you know, as it were under duress because of the uh, the terrible situation of the Soviet Union brought to the West during the 20th mm -hmm. century, and that obviously was you know part of God's providential design is for us people like you and myself coming into contact with Orthodox Christianity um, through the living experience of, uh, of, of Russians and, and Russian nationality and its close association mm -hmm. with that faith. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. I mean, I was mentioning uh, earlier today that, that um, a big uh, event in my life was reading a novel by Dostoevsky, The Idiot, which, um, which really profoundly affected me. Well, that's, I mean, that's even more so, you know, the life of uh, Sergius of Radenez or something like that, you know, can, can have a very powerful impact on someone living in the West, living in North America, who may be a Christian, maybe not a Christian, but maybe a Christian, uh, you know, open to uh, Christianity and talk of the gospel, um, and then finding it embodied in the life of a saint like Sergius of Radenez. Mm -hmm. uh, Seeing an example in the in the in the life of Vladimir, uh, equal of the apostles of statecraft, you know, we could use that in our in our political system today in America for sure. 
So there's so many examples. I mean, obviously, Elizabeth the New Martyr, she, her example has had such an impact on, on people living in North America. I mean, how many people are converts to Orthodox Christianity, and if they're female, take the name Elizabeth after her, but how many of us, you know, just think of her and read her life and so forth and find inspiration in it? Mm -hmm. After all, she herself was a convert from the West. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Holy Russia is something that really can um, evangelize even America. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, can we open up for some questions for a few minutes? I'm sorry, I lied. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the the quest the question essentially is how much of of, of Holy <coughs> Russia was m a political project or if you like a ro a romantic I can't say it romanticization of, of of history as opposed to a really spiritual effort is is that is that there as well? Yeah, well certainly as I you know the the movement that I describe in the book did have political consequences it did have political expressions. I would argue it was not primarily or fundamentally political, it was fundamentally evangelical. Um, use the word spiritual um, at, in distinction from political, um, and spiritual it was. We want to remember, of course, that um, Christianity being a, uh, you know, the expression of uh, our faith in the incarnate God, Jesus Christ, um, the principle of the incarnation <clears throat> means that all aspects of human experience can be uh, sanctified, can be brought into the life of the church. And that goes with politics as well. As, as brutal as politics can be, as, as uh, cynical as politics can make us, and for good reason, <laughs> um, the fact is, is that statecraft, government, can be sanctified and was sanctified uh, over the course of history by many Christian rulers. Um, just to take the example of Russia, of course, Vladimir is a good example, but there are many other canonized um, saintly rulers of Russia um, the last czar, Nicholas II, would be another great example of that. Um, so the, the fact that this movement got involved in politics, I think, should not immediately make us raise our eyebrows or feel uncomfortable with that. It's what effect did getting involved in politics have. And so what you may have ex ex experienced somewhat in the, in the book that I wrote was that in some cases, there was a mingling with political groups themselves that seemed, A, not to have a great deal of interest in the gospel. Their objectives were nationalistic. Their objectives were essentially power. Um, and, and B, um, by getting involved uh, with those groups, they, the uh, clergy and the other uh, uh, supporting uh, leadership of the movement I call Orthodox Patriotism, uh, did sometimes get off track, I think, from from a from a more evangelical goal. 
but again, yeah, I don't think that their their readiness to do that was necessarily wrong. You know, it may have just been that in many cases they were just, you know, they they unfortunately got involved with groups that themselves uh, don't look very um, uh, admirable in hindsight. And then another thing, just to throw on top of that, is the the great tragedy of all of this. You know, I use the word carefully, but you have you have a, a historical experience in Russia of the state supporting the Orthodox faith, even under the empire, where the rulers often behaved like they didn't care much about the Orthodox faith. Nevertheless, um, nevertheless, uh, you you had this experience of the of the state saying the Orthodox faith is the faith of this land, and it's going to be protected, and we're going to honor it publicly in our in our common life together. Now, in the period that I'm discussing in the book, that collapses, and that all but collapses. So by the end of the period, um, religious toleration has been um, has been introduced, uh, and the clergy are in great confusion about what this means for the Orthodox faith. In America, you know, as as Americans, we often think that um, that any kind of association of faith and government is always bad. But in fact, in the historical experience of Russia, um, it often had very good results. And they were trying; these these church leaders were trying um, to correct the mistakes of the government historically and bring the gospel, bring the faith back into the life of that government in a way that Vladimir again was such a such a great example of. So, I don't know if that answers the question. Prior to Peter the Great, who began to uh, dominate church life uh, based on Protestant models that he saw going on in England. Um, if you could compare that and also compare that to the founding fathers of this country who were reacting very much against the very same model that Peter had been trying to copy. And do you see parallels in, in what the founding fathers? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll just try and re- repeat the question briefly. The question is the the understanding of church-state relations of some of the late 19th century uh, Russian leaders who are mentioned in Father John's book and contrasting that with uh, the understanding of particularly Peter the Great who's looking, if you like, at an English model and then on the other side of the Atlantic, the American founding fathers who are coming up with a completely different version of church-state relations, partly as a as a as a revolution against what's the situation in England is that a fair summary? Yeah. yeah, and not only in England but in other parts of mm-hmm. Europe where those relations were even more violent than they had been in England. Yeah, well that's a great question. It's a complex question, so I'll just try to answer it as briefly and and concisely as I can. Um, the model that was most often expressed by the politically conservative clergy that made up the, the, the majority of the so-called orthodox patriots uh, that I talk about in the book, the dominant model of government, the favored model, was, uh, was, was not only monarchy but autocracy, autocracy, which was the historical model of Russian government, uh, at least from the time of Peter and, and all the way back to Ivan the Terrible and Ivan the Great even in the 15th century. Some a model of government um, borrowed or um, worked out uh, through the uh, through the encounter of Russia historically with Byzantium. Of course, the Roman emperors who ruled the Roman Empire once they became Christian maintained autocracy uh, as a form of government. Autocracy had no place for any kind of representative assemblies and constitutional limits. Uh, it also, in its Byzantine form had a very clear place for faith, 
the faith was authorized by and supported by the state, the autocratic state. And over the course of time in Russia, the effect of that was to support the uh, conversion of a large number of people into a community that was known as Rus uh, in the past and in, in, in the time of the, uh, of the people in my book, uh, Russia, Russia, Russia. And uh, of course, we lose that in the English language, Rus and Russia mean a hugely different things to a Russian speaker, and we Americans only have one word, Russia. So um, it, it I, I could be said, actually, just kind of by way of digression, <laughs> uh, that the word Holy Russia that I use in a very limited sense in this book, like on the title, um, is really properly rendered Holy Rus, and that's how I use it in most of the book. To a Russian-speaking person, um, Holy Russia, Holy Russia, Svetaya Russia, that just doesn't, it's never used, not, not in my experience anyway. So anyway, back to the 19th century and to Russia rather than Rus, to the empire rather than the more homogeneous nation of the Middle Ages following Vladimir, their model was autocracy, and they were trying very hard to um, preserve autocracy in the name of Nicholas II, especially Alexander III before him, uh, in the, with a sense, with a conviction that if that is lost, I mean, they were looking around them, and, and what, what, did, what had arisen in Russia at this time? It was a secularistic intelligentsia. They saw what was going on in the West by the 19th century. It's like, you know, Christian statecraft is, 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 is in decline, if not all, altogether gone. And they were very self-consciously aware of America, where our founding fathers put together with the First Amendment and so forth, a clear separation a distinction between the state and religion, and were very um, cautious and even suspicious. Thomas Jefferson was very suspicious, very hostile to the idea that religion would con consciously influence government. And so they uh, would have, they would have emerged in a comparison there with one comparative that you gave me, the founding fathers of our country as being completely different in their understanding of the proper place of, uh, of religion within the political life of a state. Now to jump back to the 17th century, to the reign of, say, Alexei or uh, Michael before him, or even back to the time of Ivan Grozny and Ivan the Terrible and earlier, well, there you also had the state supporting the church very powerfully, but in a less... Um, overbearing way, as you brought attention to, Peter was influenced by the uh, model of government in England where the monarch was the supreme head of the Church of England, right, because of the Reformation. Uh, he was also influenced by actually by uh, Lutheran and, uh, and Reformed um, patterns of um, uh, governance in, uh, in, in Germany at that time. And, of course, the model in in let's call it Muscovite Russia and Kievan Russia was of symphony, uh, gained also from Byzantium, where emperors like Justinian had put together a vision of how the state should be in relationship to the hierarchy. And it, remember, it's not a church-state relationship because church and state are the same community. So that's the problem of our modern American understanding of government and religion is that we see them as opposed to each other. But in Byzantium, as in Muscovite Russia, for instance, the ruler was a member of the church. So you don't talk about the, the, the church versus the state. The state is within the church. And so that harmony, that symphony, was the ideal. And you often see this worked out. Uh, I think it's Alexei, uh, of course, father to Peter, but Alexei in the late 17th century, uh, who canonizes um, uh, the martyr Philip of Moscow, Metropolitan Philip. Well, what's his story? He'd been put to death by Ivan the Terrible in this brutal uh, ex um, exercise of power by the government against the church, right, in the 16th century. Well, it was the very state, the heir to Al uh, Ivan the Terrible, that holds up this martyr, this, 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 this wonderful metropolitan Philip, um, as an example. So what a wonderful example of how the state could see clearly the truth and the, the, the importance of the Orthodox faith even if it meant um, putting limitations on the state's freedom to act in a dictatorial or tyrannical way. So this is, if I may, would you say that then these uh, 19th century um, Russian church leaders, uh, did they have a, a vision of, of church 
sacrifices with more freedom and autonomy than had been permitted during the Samaritan period and the subjugation of the church by, by the um, Syria authorities? Uh, autonomy of the church in relationship to government or in relation, uh, or autonomy of, of believers in society generally, religious fr freedom and toleration? Well, it, it primarily in relation to the government because of how strictly church life had been regulated mm -hmm. by a bureaucratic system during the, the Samaritan period. Were they trying to break out of that uh, to have more autonomy and to be sort of a, a freer, uh, a, a more freedom for, for, for to run their own lives, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Like that's that's an interesting question. I, I think it's very interesting. Antoni Krapovitsky, again, is a good example of a hierarch who was very committed to the um, government of Nicholas II, very faithful to it, very um, very respectful of the tradition of autocracy as it existed historically in the Russian state. However, he was also very committed to liberating the Orthodox Church from any kind of secularistic constraints that that state may have put upon it, and a big supporter of res restoring the patriarchate, for instance. So he would be an example. Um, he was very prominent in this effort of orthodox patriotism that I talk about. What's interesting in this story is to see how the clergy hold on to autocracy until it's like it's, it's no longer viable. Only at the end of this narrative, kind of, you can almost see them kind of like trying to figure out what to do now, once um, once the Duma is created, once the 1905 revolution has led Nicholas II to concede some level of, of, um, of, of you might call it not representative government, kind of a step in that direction, people like Yuan Vastorgov, um, who was later martyred in 1918, um, he's another important figure in the, in the story that I tell in the book. You can just see him at the very end, like 1917, starting to say, well, if the state is no longer, once the revolution has happened, we actually have some documents from him. Like, it's amazing to read. Because he had been so much a part of the Russian state up until the revolution. And then suddenly, at the very end of his life, he realizes there's no more state to support the church. He, he just begins talking a little bit about how we can manage this on our own then. If the state is against us, a Patriarch Tikhon's a better example, um, if the state is against us, we, we, can, we can move forward because, you know, as, as the church, we've... We've done this in the past, and in the end, we can exist without the state. So there's even a suggestion there that, yes, without autocracy, these these uh, these these leaders would be able to find a way forward. It would certainly be the church's um, conviction that she can she can exist, obviously, without auto autocratic statecraft, and has. Yeah, there's a question at the back. Yeah, right. So the, the question is basically is what is the <clears throat> what is the potential effect of the if you like the resurrection of the idea of holy Russia and of appropriating from Russian nationalism uh, how might that play out not in r what's now Russia proper but the so-called near abroad Ukraine Belarus and and other countries of which formerly belongs to this, the Russian empire C uh, could this actually have negative consequences. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'm not really well educated on the contemporary situation, so um, anything I would say would have to be qualified by that. You know, I really haven't studied that, researched that. Um, but just to try to make an effort at a, a kind of a couple observations, um, 
Well, again, we're talking about Rus and not Russia. So when this conversation takes place in Russian, it's, um, as I'm sure it is in the translation we're, that's being done right now, it's Rus, Svetaya Rus. Well, Svetaya Rus, as far as I know, is as, um, as um, uh, appealing a phrase to a Ukrainian, modern Ukrainian, as, as to modern Russian or to model, modern Belarusian. Um, so I don't think that the, the very core of what we're talking about is in any way necessarily divisive. Now, it is a fact that certainly the people I talked about celebrated not only saints from a very early stage in the history of East Slavic Orthodoxy um, involving modern Ukrainians, Belarusians, as well as Great Russians, okay? But, but um, they talked about Vladimir. Um, but they also talked about Sergius of Radenesh, who's more affiliated with, you know, the Mongol or even the Muscovite period, or someone like um, Patriarch Germagen of Moscow. Obviously, um, not someone that the Ukrainian Orthodox Church might directly look to as, as someone who preceded um, it, uh, contributed to its formation. So you could, you could say you can make both observations. I, th I think really in the end, I think if, if, if the gospel, if Christianity, if Jesus Christ, if the whole faith of the fathers of the Orthodox Church is put forward first, nationality, again, this is what the project's all about that they, they undertook, nationality is, is useful and valuable to the extent that it, it strengthens that. So, yeah, the Russian near abroad today is, is racked by all sorts of divisions. There's a lot of bad feeling between Ukrainians and Russians, I know. That finds its way into church life. There's some examples of, um, you know, breakaway Ukrainian uh, uh, ecclesiastical bodies that stand for nationalism, you know, at all costs. And that, that's an obvious sign of when, you know, when this whole this whole utilization of nationality becomes an idol, becomes something that that detracts from the faith in our salvation. Um, I don't know how how relevant it is to this, but I, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, when New martyr uh, Vladimir of Kiev was put to death in 1918. Um, he was put to death by by communists, but by communists who identified with Ukrainian nationalism, if I'm not mistaken. And he stood for a, a universal Orthodox Church within the community that had once been the Russian Empire. He stood for that, and and they put him to death because they were communists, but they also put him to death because they were Ukrainians, and they didn't want that that expression of Russianness kind of in their midst. And so there we see nationalism driving the division. And and Vladimir stood for something greater than, than nationalism. I think if if the church leadership is clear um, in our time, um, these divisions or potential divisions can be overcome or or um, or altogether obviated by by a real focus on the faith that we hold commonly. Is there a second question? That who were opposed to it? Uh, three three questions which I have to try to remember. The first the first question I think we take about one at a time, and see if we can remember the other two by the time we answer the first one is was the church actually in favor of the liberation of the serfs? Okay, so <clears throat> that's a uh, a question that I'm not well qualified to answer because I haven't done the research into that. Of course, it is a metropolitan Fioret who writes the edict of um, of liberation. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I don't know if like there's documents that we have where some professor has found some parish priest saying, oh, this is a bad idea. I don't know. Really, I don't. But we do know at the highest levels, the church supported that. And then the, the second question was, in terms of the, the voices within the church speaking for the 
idea of Holy Russia in the late 19th century. Was this a majority of the clergy, only a very small section? To what extent was this idea the predominant, I suppose, idea in, in, in church life, say, in the, the late, the latter 20, last 20 years of the 19th century? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And, and I mentioned in the epilogue uh, to the book, I probably should have mentioned it at the introduction, but there were other voices in the in the Russian Orthodox Church at this time that did not um, participate in and were even put off a little bit by the emphasis upon nationality that was uh, expressed by this community of, of church leaders. However, that community of church leaders were the best, I think, most um, influentially placed. Um, so a lot of them were on the, the synod, for instance, which meant a great deal. Um, they had a lot of influence and appeal. Um, and so, yes, I think they were quite influential. What percentage do they make up of the overall, let's say, clergy? That's not possible. We can't possibly get a, uh, a real clear number there. What I do argue in the book is this is a relatively new phenomenon. It's true that early in Russian history, people like Ilarion of Kiev, uh, Makari, uh, uh, Makarius of Moscow, were church um, leaders who advanced a sense of Russian nationality. But in the imperial period, we don't find much of that until the period I'm talking about here. And that, hence, is the reason why the title is The Making of Holy Russia, because this was not being done uh, for a long time before before the period I discuss. The third question I think I'd like to hold over, if, if there are any other questions, and I'll, and then if, because the third question hopefully can be answered very quickly. So, Father Peter, is there? So the, the basic question is to contrast this period of Russian history, the late 19th century, and the understanding of nationalism and its relation to the church at that time uh, with, the, with the period of Patriarch Nikon and the attempts to reform the liturgical practices and so on, which led to the, to the old believer schism, which I'm struggling, but I'm thinking is probably in the 16th century, but happy to be corrected. Yeah. Well, 17th century is when the schism itself takes place and Nikon is Patriarch of Moscow. Um, Nikon was ultimately rejected by the, uh, by the Russian Orthodox Church in the 17th century, ultimately rejected because of his largely almost papal kind of tyrannical kind of... Um, but that's the, that, thank you, that's the point. His reforms, his vision of a healthy Orthodox Christianity in Russia was not. Um, what he stood for in that vision even though he personally was later re removed from, from authority, his vision was that the church, the faith is universal. It is not limited to the people called the Rus. Okay? And it was a universal faith. It was a faith that brought Russians into community with the Greeks. And he looked to the Greeks for a lot of the um, you know, patterns of church life and so forth. You know, how many E's do you use to spell the name Jesus? How, do you, how many fingers do you use to cross yourself? Things like this. The old believers, of course, you know, they were very unhappy with that. And many of them, well, I guess anyone who was, was called an old believer, went into schism over that very issue. Now, that, that was an example of how nationalism can so permeate orthodox ecclesial self-consciousness. Um, National self-consciousness can 
can so determine ecclesial self-consciousness, you wind up with a nation church, a nation church, where the church is somehow limited to the nation involved. And the, the tragedy of old belief is that uh, many of its adherents chose, um, chose that course. Uh, the larger Orthodox Church in Russia did not. By the late 19th century, interestingly, it is the old believers that a lot of the people I'm talking about are fascinated by because of their example of living a, 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 faith, a, a life in faith, faithful commitment to a tradition that goes back beyond Peter the Great. And they become kind of the, um, really, for a lot of these people that I talk about, because a, a lot of these church leaders were in missions to the old believers. I mean, I, I don't know how many hierarchs and, and biographies of priests that I came across, especially hierarchs, who had spent some time among the old believers of a given region you know, dealing with old belief as a challenge, a missionary challenge. And the old believer commitment to Russian nationality, still alive and well in the 19th century, was often being held up, I, uh, paradoxically, um, to by these, by these Orthodox patriots. But they were always very clear that there was a fundamental flaw in old belief, and that was it did not have a universal scope. It was limited to the Russian nation. And for all the Orthodox patriots that I discuss, um, Russian nationality is ultimately uh, subordinate to, to ecclesial identity, the universal church, the Orthodox church. So they show up all over the place. The old believers are in almost every chapter of my book um, and even come out themselves to start writing in an Orthodox patriotic way by the end of the uh, empire. Thank you. I think just to, to finish with the, the third question from before, um, do you have another book that you would like to write? Well, yeah, so I, um, I'm very interested right now in, in a longer period of time in <clears throat> the history of Christendom. Um, I'm actually doing right now a podcast on Ancient Faith Radio, which is called The Rise and Fall of Christendom, and I, I started off as a 20-episode study. Um, I've completed 20 episodes and just finished part one of four parts, so, so much for that, 25 episodes. So it looks like it's more like 100 episodes. Uh, but that's that's the book that I would like to write next if uh, God grants me the the, the 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 many years I'll need to uh, to complete it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, just to say, as this uh, the the book is here, there are a few copies over here. Obviously, it's available in the monastery's bookstore all the time. But t for tonight only, uh, to tempt the impoverished amongst us to empty their wallets, uh, it will be for sale for a mere twenty dollars, which is even less than Amazon, and with a free a free signature put in put in it by the author. So uh, if you'd like to uh, lighten your wallet by $20, there are at least 10 copies there available to do that. And uh, in desperation, we might even be able to get online and take a credit card. So uh, again, just strange to thank, thank Father John. And uh, thank you very much.